Hello again, ladies and gentlemen, Saka here, and welcome to episode one of a continuing series transferred over from Crusader Kings 2 in Europa Universalis 4. And if you've been following along with that playthrough, you knew that we conquered all of the Isles of Great Britain. But looking at the converted save on the political map mode, you can see that we own most of the cores in Ireland. We own uh, some cores down here, but there are some English loyal counties in the middle, so England is still in the game. And also Scotland. Uh, these three counties here were Scottish uh, faithfuls, and we actually have some uncolonized uh, areas of land, which is interesting. The converter, it said it was out of date, and Paradox hasn't really touched the converter in a bit. So this is the game doing as best as it could, and I'm just happy to continue where we picked up. We can see France still down there, our buddies Aquitaine and Aquitanian Iberia down here, looking very different from the base game of Europa Universalis 4, or from Crusader Kings 2. And uh, everything outside of this little border will be unaffected, but we can see that Mongolia is a pretty huge. Um, the rest of these guys should be pretty stock to the base game. Uh, the poor Ottoman is being crushed by Byzantium, and the Native American population is pretty much untouched, and we'll get over there when we start colonizing, but without further ado, let's look over how to start a game in Europa Universalis 4. We are going to be the Kingdom of Great Britain, and we can see our High King right there, Finnish J, who in this game is a 4-3-2, and we will talk about what those numbers mean here in a minute. We also have 38 develop or counties with 446 development and seven fort. So pretty good. So let's go ahead and get started. We will play, and we will go normal because we can't do Iron Man. This is a converted save and it won't let us do such a thing as these but for this first episode uh, we're going to get set up we're going to make our first moves as quote unquote Great Britain uh, formerly known as Ireland and our first order of business will be to grab Scotland grab England and colonize our um, colonize our little uncolonized pieces of land here which I guess was so underdeveloped in the base game that it said, you know what? People don't even live here. So looking at the main screen here, this is our bread and butter. This is where we're going to work for our uh, series. First of all, you see our country, and it's the Union Jack of Great Britain. When we click on that tab, we get all kinds of information about who we are. We are the 40-year-old High King Finnish J. Ubrain which we brought over from our save. We are a 4-3-2. Our heir is 12 years old with a strong claim, a 2-4-2. So unlike Crusader Kings 2, which is focused on the family and um, interpersonal relationships and vassals being people, in Europa Universalis 4, we're looking at the country level. What are we as a country and the world domination from a country standpoint? Looking here, we, you can see that we generate seven administrative power each month, six diplomatic power each month, and five military power each month. And these are these points right here that we used to do things like enact laws, claim, um, claim land that we take in war, tech up, more importantly. So the tech tree is completely different and more streamlined, in my opinion. Uh, hire generals, do things like that with these uh, magical points of power. In order to gain more, we can recruit advisors that are paid each month. And looking at our treasury, we only make one gold a month, but I think we can swing it for a bit while we get our trade and everything situated. So let's get a basic level one advisor. And we can see the levels here, one, two, and two. We can see the, um, the perk for each advisor how much their base cost is to hire and how much each month it takes. And this is how many points, in this case, uh, administrative, we generate extra each month. Now this is diminishing returns. You can see that this three uh, priced guy gives us half of William, but he costs 62. 
So it's much better to take the level one national unrest guy. So we'll go ahead and do that. We'll go ahead and hire our diplomatic advisor. And all these three are level one. So diplomatic reputation is how well we can interact with other countries, uh, how quick we gain bonuses. Spy network is how quickly we set up spy networks in other countries to make claims. That could be pretty powerful here in the early game, um, allowing us to get into Scotland and England without their spies counter spying on us or improved relations. So as we send our diplomats out to make nice, nice with our friends, say Aquitaine, that is a 20% increase in monthly ticks. So really not a bad choice all around here. But I think for the time being, while we are getting claims and expanding, Spy Network is going to be good. So I'll go ahead and take that. And as far as a military advisor, we only have one level one guy, and he is a disciplined guy. Um, so this is properly dr drilled troops. Think of it like if your buddy next to you gets his face blown off, how quick are you to run away? And that affects the morale. So these guys are a little bit more hardened. They'll, they'll hold their line a little bit longer with more discipline, allows you to you know, deal more damage and all that good stuff. So we will hire the Commandant. And we're good for advisors. And that is our first tab we are set up. Next is our government tab. We can see accepted cultures and the percentage of our land that is that culture. Once we tech up, we can get uh, some promoted cultures here. And Anglo-Saxon would not be a bad one to pick because half our land is Anglo-Saxon people. If we promote the culture, they become accepted and those people will stay happy. We can also see any country modifiers from events that we get, as well as our national uh, manpower modifier and our income from vassals, thanks to us being a feudal monarchy. Diplomacy. So in this screen, this is how we interact with the rest of the world. We have five slots open for diplomatic re relations, and that is things like a military alliance, military access, fleet basing rights, also royal marriages. Things like that go into diplomatic relations as well as vassals. So if we wanted to vassalize Scotland, for example, and take them over peacefully, integrate them at a later time without going to war, that would be a diplomatic relations slot filled. These are our enemies, Denmark, France, and Aquitaine. Now that is definitely odd because in Crusader Kings 2, Aquitaine was seen as a best friend, but they have rivaled us, meaning they see us as a threat. They are more likely to go to war with us, which I would like that to not happen. So I, me, as far as I go, I will not make Aquitaine a rival, but definitely I will pick some rivals, and that's this first tab right here. I'll make France a rival, for sure. We are going to be going to France. Now, I could stop there if I wanted to improve relations with Denmark. And I mean, they're pretty big, but, you know, they have some land that we might be able to take. Uh, the, the Navy is a lot more powerful in this game, so it wouldn't be anything for us to ferry troops over and take some of this land here. Definitely not bad. And since they've rivaled us, you know, we can get some what's called power project projection by rivaling long-term rivals. So, you know what? We might as well. Let's go ahead and rival Denmark as well. But I will keep Aquitaine happy. I'll try to improve as relations as best I can with Aquitaine. And then if we become so big that they're no longer a valid rival, then we can start making nice nice which I'd like to do with Aquitaine because we got a history. Next tab is economy. This is where we can see how much money we are making. So we get 10 ducats a month from taxation, six from production, 2.47 from trade. And that's before we discuss trade. That number will go up when I start sending my ships out and you'll see. We can see what we are paying for. So fleet maintenance is four and a half ducats a month. Army maintenance is nine and a half ducats a month at full morale. So we can see right here the full green bars, and that means that these armies are going in, fit, ready to go. If we were to try to save money and not go to war immediately, we could drop that slider down and try to make some money. We would make a little under one ducat a month if we're not paying our soldiers the maximum, if we're paying them the bare minimum. However, 
If we go to war and these guys are caught out with low morale, it will be a very quick battle and we would probably get stack wiped. So we don't want to lose 9,000 troops in a few days. So for now, we have enough gold padded up that I think we can rate, keep our maintenance high for the time being. We could also turn off some of these forts that you see here, but forts in this game provide a little bit of a bonus. The land around our forts are protected by this guy. If another country was to siege this down and not the fort, this will be taken back automatically. So forts are very good. It also takes much, much longer to siege down a fort rather than an unprotected county because, you know, defensiveness. They could take Gwynedd in a month, but Shrewsbury would take some time. It's a level two fort. They have to bring some manpower. They have to, you know, siege it down like we did in CK2. All the while, it's protecting the nearby provinces that we own. So I don't want to turn off the forts just in case England decides to feel froggy and go right away. So that is, and we were talking about that on the economy tab, we can take out loans, but to loans are taken out auto magically, so we're not going to worry about a loan button. And this is our inflation. If we take gold from other uh, nations in war, that raises our inflation because we have a whole lot more money to spend making everyone richer, making it supply and demand, things cost more. So that's going to be the inflation that goes up. Right now we have no inflation. The prices are going to be as cheap as they will be the rest of the game. Next up is the trade. Now this is one of the more confusing tabs of Europa Universalis. And a quick way to look at it is the trade map mode here. So we can see what's called trade nodes. If we own land in, say, the North Sea, that's going to be this baby blue. All the way up here, all the way up here is the North Sea node. Now everyone who owns land in the North Sea node is contributing to the trade there. And everyone is fighting for a space in the English Channel node. If I click on that specific node, you can see all of the stats about it. So we can see that 74 can be retained by Great Britain because we own 75% of the land in the North Sea. We can see also we have trade power. Now trade power means how well we can retain all of the gold in this North Sea. The more power we have, it doesn't matter what they, what these guys are doing, France, Austria, Pomerania, Denmark, we are able to hold. If we are telling our merchant to collect, we are collecting more than they can move out. Now that's what these arrows are for. We can see that trade is coming into the North Sea from all the way around here from the White Sea. And it's also coming in from the New World. Once colonies get established, this will be an established trade route coming into the North Sea. And everything from the North Sea is channeling into the English Channel. And this is a very, very rich end node. What that means is any money coming in is not leaving. If you can collect here, that, that's the best thing because you can't transfer out of here. The money in the English Channel goes nowhere. So the ultimate goal for us would be get as much trade power and production as we can in this golden yellow area because that's a lot of money. So we just funnel everything we can down from the North Sea into here. And if we have all of the trade power here, we collect everything. So right now we have two merchants and they are in the English Channel collecting and they're in Lubeck collecting. Now our home node should be the North Sea, and I don't know why we are not collecting from the North Sea. So let's tell them to collect the trade and Samuel will be coming from Lubeck to collect here and try to get some more moolah. And we'll also collect in the English Channel if we can. We don't have a whole lot of trade power down here, um, but since this is our, our home node, if we're collecting, we're, we're preventing as much as we can from leaving and going over here to Lubeck. So that's, that's our, our trade plan as of now. We can see a breakdown of all the modifiers that go into trade. And basically, we're, we're going to stay pretty hands-off with trade. Just know, the more land you can take in a node and you can collect from, the better. And if you want more money in a certain location, grab the node that it's coming from. So now we move on to technology, 
and we can see what's called administrative, diplomatic, and military technologies. Those are purchased with these points. So going back to our first tab, you can see what we're making each month and how that adds up to our overall count. When we go to technology, we can see that we need 598 points to purchase the level four administrative tech, which gives us temples. We need 598 to grab the marketplace, which increases our trade range and gives us the marketplace, which gives us trade power wherever we build them. And military tech, we are 598 military power away from getting more morale for everybody and military tactics for everybody. And when we discuss units, uh, we'll go more into those, but basically, of course, the, the higher you are in military tech, the more you're able to wreck face. We can also see what's called the institutions. So throughout the game, these different institutions are gonna pop up. First is feudalism, and everyone just came out of Crusader Kings. They are feudal, but the Renaissance will spawn, and it usually spawns in Italy, historically, and it spreads dynamically. The provinces that it's next to get it first, and so on and so on. There's also modifiers that if you have a port, you know, sharing a sea tile and, and things like that, we can see the breakdown when it actually spawns. But when it does spawn, we're going to start getting a penalty of an institution's tech for not embracing the new ideas. So then this cost will go up. Also, if we are ahead of time, if we research something before we were historically supposed to, we will get a penalty for the next research. And then if we choose not to upgrade our tech, if we spend our points elsewhere, we will get a reduction in cost to catch up. So when institutions fire, uh, we'll go more into depth. But just know the Renaissance is first. And in order to embrace the technology, we have to get it in our shores. The provinces have to get it themselves. And then as provinces get in and spread it, based on our development, there is a percentage cap that we have to hit. A certain percentage of our development has to have the Renaissance, and then we can pay money to get the rest of the idea. So you will see that here soon. The next tab is the Ideas tab. You can see it's unlocked at National Ideas 5. That's admin, admin Tech 5. We can unlock what's called Idea Group. So there will come a time in the game where we are getting so many points that we don't want to waste points going ahead of time so we get extra bonuses here and these ideas vary in the different categories and we spend 400 of each point in each individual idea and each individual idea has a different bonus each idea has a different finisher and when we complete that we can combine two ideas together to get uh, bonuses that we can spend admin points on a monthly basis on but as it stands now we have what's called the British Ideas. As we research more and more ideas, this, tab, this bar will fill up. So after three ideas, we get diplomatic annexation costs and the number of states. After three more ideas, we get global settle increase, which helps colonialism. We get 15% global tariffs. We get 5% reduction in technology costs, 5% more discipline, 20% more produced goods, and blockade efficiency and naval leader maneuver. And each one of these costs three ideas. So 1,200 diplo points or admin points or military points, any combination of those gets the next bump. Missions have been overhauled since the base game. Missions now have requirements to fulfill. So as we look through here and we see what the British ideas are going to be, we can see that we can complete missions by fulfilling certain tasks. Our first task is actually already done. We discovered India. So we will click and we've gained 100 Diplo points, 20 Navy tradition, and we get a claim on West Bengal. So now we can actually go to war over here. Of course, that's not way beyond our scope in 1444, but now we can establish trade or chart the Southern Seas as our next step. So when you're wondering, what should I do now in my game? We can either levy troops. So we get 100% of the force limit. Manpower at 60%. So we can see we need 45,270 to cap the manpower. 60% of that. And then get one general. Then we can fulfill this to get 
a permanent claim on Munster, Connacht, Ulster, Leinster, Lowlands, the Scottish Marches, Perth, Argyll, Inner Hebrides, Iverness, Sutherland, and the subjugation uh, CB on Scotland. Pretty powerful. Based on what our force limit is, 64. So if we were to recruit, uh, math, 16 more troops, which we have enough manpower to do, and then we just sat and let our manpower increase, we can complete that mission. We also have two countries have an alliance with Great Britain and 150 opinion. We have income of at least 31 gold per month. And then is at war with France and we, or we return Maine to France in the surrender of Maine event to fire the Hundred Years War, which is probably what's going to happen. Um, I kind of want to focus here up north, but we're definitely going to France. I mean, that that's just what we do. The next tab is the Decisions tab, and you can see we had a national decision pop up here. Because we have a theologian um, in our court, he's right there, John Capgrave, we have the ability to get 0.5% missionary strength at a reduction of 5% spread. Now, that seems like a terrible idea to me because we're all Catholic. If we go to our religion map mode, we can see that Catholicism is pretty rampant. We have orthodoxy over here, and it's not going to get over to our shores, so we don't need missionaries. For now, I will turn off that event so we don't get a pop-up. Stability. So this is where our war exhaustion is. The more we are at war, the more this goes up. If we start losing battles, if our holdings start getting taken, that increases the war exhaustion, and that has bad things. Um, so if we get war exhausted, you'll see that. Stability is the amount of unrest that can be reduced, the taxes that can be pulled, how strong our missionaries are. High stability is very good, but it costs admin points to get. And as you can see, we need 100 admin points just to click that button. And we might want to start getting churches for more local taxes. So this is where the trade-off and strategy comes in. Do we spend our points on tech or do we spend it on other things like stability? We have 12 states and five territories. Once we unlock more states, we'll be able to, to group things together in our state map mode here. So we can see uh, claims on certain states. That's the state of the highlands. And you can see these are the lowland states. These are the highland states. And we need this province to you know, continue on building states. Think of it like a duchy is the easiest way to think of it. We also have overextension, so as we claim territories here, we get what's called an overextension cost. This stops us from grabbing an entire country in war because, you know, the new administration can't handle a whole nother country literally overnight. The overextension is reduced by making things a core. When we click on a county, we can see what the core is. Great Britain considers this the homeland, but if we were to take this uh, piece of land, France considers this a piece of their home. We can core that and say, you know what? It's also British. And then that deals with the unrest and the fact that France can then claim that war over that territory again. Now claims go away um, from people that inherited in war. So this will always be a French core till the end of the game. But if someone, say Aquitaine, took this piece of land and then we took this piece of land uh, their their claim their core would go away if we've held it for a hundred years something like that people will forget that they were once Aquitanian if that makes any sense each individual county has its own development with DLC you could spend your points to increase this development but this is how developed a county is how rich a single county is so we've got four base tax four base production and three manpower in Gloucester for a total development of 11. Of course, London is going to be very developed, twice as powerful as Gloucester, and even has an estuary and a coastal center of trade. So these counties have individual modifiers that go along with them that makes it more powerful in their note. And we also have building slots here. Going over to religion, we are 100% Catholic. We have 100% religious unity. We are 5% tolerant of Catholics, but heretics 
the Orthodox we don't think too highly of. We actually look on them just as we would look upon the Muslim belief. So, you know, it's, it's Catholicism or nothing at this point. Looking at the military, these are our troops. We have Latin Medieval Infantry and the Chevache Cavalry. So we can see that in this particular army, we have 13,000 troops made up of nine regiments of infantry and four of cavalry. Each regiment can hold a maximum of 1,000, and as troops die, they will reinforce up to that number. And this is the amount of men in a uh, division is exactly how powerful they are. At 1,000 troops, they hit at 100% strength. If they have 900 troops, they are 90% effective, 800 troops, 80% effective, and so on. You want to try to keep 1,000 men in these regiments if you can, but each individual regiment will lose individual men. So what you can do is consolidate them out or shift consolidate them out. So shift consolidating will keep the number of regiments there, but there will be regiments with zero men in it, and then they will reinforce up to 1,000 from the manpower. If you just click the button, consolidate, it will group everyone together, and then this number will go down. It says, well, we only have enough to support seven infantry, so that's all we are going to reinforce with. So that's the difference between a consolidation and a shift consolidation. We can see here seven and two, and cavalry can only make up 50%, at least in Great Britain, cavalry can only make up 50% of an army. So for these 9,000 troops, we could only hold 9,000 cap. For these 7,000 troops, we could only hold 7,000 cap. Now they are very expensive. They cost 16 gold per month. Well, you know, the 16 gold and then the base maintenance um, just sitting still. When they reinforce, it gets very expensive. So we try to keep cavalry out of sieges. Um, it's a 2% attrition no matter what. When you siege down a county, you don't want to siege with cavalry because, you know, 2%, they start losing, you know, 20 troops a month. And then those 20 troops have to come from the manpower pool, and that comes from the cost. Very expensive. Use your infantry. They're cheap. They're effective. You know, they don't hit as hard in the shock phase, but they do damage in the fire phase. So this is how combat works in the base game. You have the shock phase and the fire phase, and they alternate. Fire, shock, fire, shock, always starting with a shock. So the infantry do the damage in the first turn. Then in the next turn, the cavalry will do damage, and they can flank. So they can come in from the side, and you line up your troops. And, you know, if your cavalry are not getting hit by the infantry in front, they can do massive shock damage. And shock is more powerful than fire at the start of the game. So we can see our naval units here as well. And what's important is the trade power of these barks. You can see for each bark we have, that is 2% trade power in a node. That's why we want to send our boats to protect trade in an area that we have, um, have trade power in. It just makes it easier to pull money from, you know. The heavies are good for combat. You know, they... Uh, they have higher combat ability thanks to our British tradition, but they pack 40 cannons rather than 10. They have a hull size of 20 versus 8. These guys can take a licking, but of course, much uh, more expensive. 0 0.03 to maintain a bark, which they make that back in trade protection, as opposed to 0.29. So one of the things that we can do to get our balance higher is to see how many heavies we got. We have 11 heavies. This is where the majority of our uh, money is being dumped from, I feel. We could roll with maybe three heavies or even two heavies and really lower our cost. So that's what I'll do. I'll create a new unit, get all of our heavies over there, select that unit, create a new unit. I'll just keep two heavies there and we will disband these nine heavies. No more maintenance costs, and now we are making one gold a month at full maintenance. We can keep those heavies in port, and I'll go ahead and select our light ships. Give them a mission to protect trade in the North Sea. We want to keep our power there nice and heavy. So here we see a breakdown of what our Navy and Army can do. 
we can see our tactics, our tradition. Tradition is important for hiring generals. The more army tradition you have when you spend 50 uh, military points to get a general, you can see the pips that they have. Now, I'm not going to roll a general just yet. When we get to war, then I'll make the decision. But right now, I kind of want to get to military tech four. But this is where we roll generals. We can also roll admirals with diplo points. And we can make our general a military leader. Interesting enough, we have a 40-year-old with a two military skill. Now, if our general leader dies in combat or leading a siege, we lose stability. So then you're thinking, oh crap, that's admin points I have to spend needlessly. If we can roll a good general, we'll keep our leader out. And then you're thinking, but hey, if I have a terrible heir, can I turn him into a leader? Yes, you can. When Fenishche Ubrain becomes of age, if we didn't like the 242, we can put him in charge of his own army. Hope he gets killed. And then we'll have a tumultuous time where we have no heir. But is it worth it? Eh, that's up for you. That's for you to decide. We can also see our combat width, so we can see how many frontline troops can engage at one time. So if we look at this, our combat width would be 13. We could technically squeeze in a few more infantry and cavalry here, but cavalry flanking bonus is only two, so it doesn't make sense to have any more cavalry than that. So really what we can do is put seven of these infantry right here, put them right there, and then once they combine, that will be our entire combat width that we can fight with. These two uh, cav here, you know, they're going to be unbalanced. We can use them as reinforcements if we need to. So that's the military screen. We can see we have three out of three forts. Then the next tab is subjects. Once we get a vassal, their opinion will appear here. With DLC, you, you can have a lot more interaction with them, but this is a DLC free run. And uh, we'll just basically see their opinion. So the first thing we can do is we can build improvements. We can upgrade our forts in any one of these holdings. What we can do is basically say what area lacks protection. And I think London would be a very good one to have a fort on. One, because it can protect three other uh, provinces. And two, that's a lot of development. And we don't want that just going away. So we will pay 200 gold to build a fort in London. I think that would be very good. It's also a coastal fort, which means the enemy would have to bring ships to blockade this fort uh, if they want any positive siege status. So that's good. Disputed succession. This is the countries in the game with very old leaders that do not have heirs. One way you can inherit land in this game is through a royal marriage with some of these people. And if they die with no heir, you can do a claim war to say, you know what? That's ours. So if any one of these look good, if any one of these look old, and we think, one, they would be a good ally, and two, we could beat their other um, royal marriage holders in war, we, could, we might be able to squeeze something out there. Claims on provinces you don't own? That's way the crap out there in Medina. We're not going over there, that's fine. So our first step, make some alliances. Who are we going to ally in this early part of the game? We can sort by opinion and we can see Galilee has some good opinion of us. They're not gonna be that good. <laughs> Let's see, Alsace, Aragon. You know what? If Aquitaine is not going to come around, Aragon might be a really good one to have. We have Baghdad, we have Bohemia, we have Burgundy. Now Burgundy is right there. That's Great Britain, that's England. So we do have a county here. I imagine Burgundy might be okay. Calabria, Cologne, Crete, Croatia, Damascus, Dauphine. Finland might be a good one. Wait, where's Finland? Are they like really, really small? Hey Finland, where are you? That's it? That's Finland? No, sir. Man. We need some allies, but holy crap. 
So Leon. Now if we allied Aragon and Leon, that might not be bad. They would come to our aid if Aquitaine decides to feel froggy and jump. And then if they don't grow too big, we might be able to vassalize them and take their lands peacefully once we start moving. Yeah, I think that would be a good thing to do. Aragon and Leon. So what? Uh, why not? Aragon? We'll open up our diplomatic boxes here. So first thing, we are going to offer an alliance. And then Leon. We're going to offer an alliance there. And then what we can do is to guarantee an heir. We can also do royal marriages next month. And then we can improve um, some opinion. So what I'm going to do is, well, no, we need to start building a spy claim on England. Can we offer vassalization almost to Scotland? If we royal marry Scotland and ally him, I think he would be a pretty good vassal. So let's do that. We're not going to move on Scotland then. We're going to ally him. We're going to royal marry him. And then we're going to fabricate claims on England. So we need to send our spy down there. You can see we have zero spy strength. We're going to build a spy network because a claim is 20 spy network power. And we do have that... Um, that... Uh, <clears throat> Yeah, in our court for spy network construction, 25%. So once we get to 20, we can start claiming Scarborough and Hull, Chester and Coventry until we're ready to go. So I think that is good. So that diplomat will be tied up. He will constantly be building spy network. The other diplomats are coming back from the capital. So it calculates distance from their capital to yours and then gives an appropriate travel time. So if we were talking all the way out here in Mongolia, we certainly could. But if we recalled him, it would take quite a while for him to walk all the way back. So let's try to keep our diplomacy local for now. All right, so we need to wait until 12 December until we can Royal Mary. And we'll see what England is going to do. They haven't picked up any alliances, which is interesting. They're improving with France. So it looks like in our game, England and France might be bedfellows. We have gained the Conquest CB against Scandus Palace. Okay. We have gained the Humiliate Rival against Denmark. We have received word that England embraced feudalism. Leaders without upkeep plus one. And that's fine. Leaders without upkeep is over here. And then we'll just wait till 11 December. We'll go ahead and get our alliance with with Aragon, Leon. Well, um, royal marriages with Aragon, Leon, Scotland, and then we'll see if we can vassalize Scotland. That'd be pretty good. Royal marriage, Scotland. Boom. All right, Aragon, Royal Marriage, confirm. And Leon, Royal Marriage, confirm. So we're getting pretty set as far as that goes. We can also boost some opinion. But let's offer a vassalization here in 17 January, 1445. Once we get his opinion up to plus 190, we can start integrating him. All right, monthly tick. Things are kicking off. What is England doing? Improving? Oh, sorry. Yeah, improving with Great Britain. So England doesn't want to die. They're improving with us, Scotland and the Pope Man. They are allied with Galicia, Holland, and Utrecht. Interesting set of choices there, guy. And here we go. 14, 15, 16, 17. Oh, they need to be at 190. Awesome. So, improve relations. Boom. So, we will keep a diplomat in Scotland, improving up to 190. 
and we can try to vassalize him. So we've got one guy in Scotland. We've got one guy doing the spy network in England. So that leaves us with a free diplomat. And I think what we can do is we can improve relations with Aragon. And we want to keep our allies nice and friendly. So there we go. We have our first moves. And already we have an alliance offer from Hungary. So let's see how we're doing here. We have three out of five diplomatic relations, Scotland, Aragon, and Leon, with royal marriages and alliance. We have enough, we have enough room for Hungary. Now they are over there and pretty powerful. It might not be a bad idea to have Hungary as an ally, maybe a long-term ally. If he grows, we can sort of do a pincer maneuver and crush the Holy Roman Empire. That might be something. And uh, sure, we will accept. We'll help each other. All right, so Hungary's a good buddy. Scotland and Aragon. And we need to... Oh, yes, embargo our rivals as the last thing we do in this episode. So we take a look at our rivals. And they are, of course, France and Denmark. So we'll go to France. We will send a... Come back from Aragon, if you please. We'll remember to send him back. We need a free diplomat. To do some embargoes here which will lower their trade power so they embargoed us we're gonna go embargo them all right France embargo rival right down there issued an embargo and then we need to do Denmark as well issue an embargo sweet and then once that diplomat comes back, down we'll go to Aragon. Improve those relations. Royal marriage from Hungary, sure. Chance of new air and all that good stuff. Improve relations. Boom. So now we have, at this point, three diplomats. We are collecting in the English Channel in the North Sea. <clears throat> It might not be a bad idea to start funneling cash from the North Sea into the English Channel. Um, use some of our power to feed all of this since it is an end node. I think I'm actually going to do that. We'll recall our merchant. It'll take him eight days and then I'll do a transfer and we'll see if that makes any difference. So in our budget tab we were making 6.8 from trade and we are going to go to Okay, so in the North Sea, we can only collect. Okay, never mind. That is fine. I thought we might be able to, uh, to pull something out. But not bad. Alright, so trade embargoes firing off. It is April 1445. And we are ready to begin our conquest. So we're improving relations with Scotland. We can improve by 483 more. So I don't think we can get him up to 190 without giving him a gift. That's perfectly fine. We will make nice nice on Scotland as best we can. We'll go ahead and get our troops down here in a place that makes sense to take some of these English uh, holdings. Let's look at the fort map mode and see where they have forts. So they have... One in Montgomery, one in Devon. And that's it. So England only has two forts. Sounds good. Let's take a look at France. So they are allied with Scotland, Brittany, and Ferrara. So good thing we're not going to attack Scotland because they, they, they made up with France. And when we annex them, bah, doesn't matter a thing. But I think this is a pretty good stopping point. I went over um, our opening moves here, our strategy, and what we plan to do in the next episode. We'll see if we can move on England. We're halfway to fabricating a claim. Each claim will be free on Diplo points if we do take it in war. So we want as many claims as, we, as possible, as we can possibly get, before moving in on war. And there's old Brittany. Alone? Looking nice. Allied with France. 
and a royal marriage. So France isn't going to annex this guy anytime soon. Well, he may. Interesting. So France may be trying to snipe this guy from us. We might be able to make nice nice, but unfortunately, our diplomats are tied up. Let's move into Aragon. Or from Aragon. Let's move into Brittany. Offer an alliance there. See if we can make him nice, nice. And that would put us at 5 out of 5 on the diplomacy, right? Yeah. I kind of want to integrate this guy. There's an alliance. We'll go ahead and do a royal marriage. We'll improve and see if we can get these guys as vassals. Royal marriage. There you go. And then we will work on improving relations. So I'll go till the end of this month. We'll go speed three. Improve some relations here. That way I can remember what I'm doing. What was that? Proclaim guarantee. Yeah. Improve relations. Nice. So we can get Brittany up to 190 for sure. We're working on Scotland as well. <clears throat> Trying to get those subjects. And working in on England. But that is going to do it for me in this episode of Europa Universalis, ladies and gentlemen. We've made our opening moves and we're ready to go. But like, share, and subscribe if you are so bold. Thank you so much for tuning in. And I will see you in the next episode of Europa Universalis. Take care.